Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and in this episode of Computer Organization and Design, we're going to move on from talking about a high-level view of the hardware and a high-level view of the software, and instead we're going to start talking about process technology. So we've talked about you know, the hardware in terms of architecture, and we've talked about the uh, the software in terms of software architecture, but we really haven't you know talked about how does a chip actually get made, and so we're going to give a brief overview here. Now, the first thing that we want to emphasize is how incredibly fast the uh, improvement rate has been uh, you know for computer architecture and uh, process technology right so if we we look down here so this gives a uh, it's a little bit of a silly comparison but it's really just to you know it's to show how fast how fast and how far things have come so 1951 early days of computing still back in the era of vacuum tubes so everything's normalized to this, you know, this relative performance per unit cost is one for vacuum tubes. So in about 14 years to the transistor, we're already about 35 times better um, for the uh, transistor. Then we move on to the integrated circuits. So we started bunching up transistors together onto a single chip, All right? So by 1975, we were, we were already at about 900 times better than a vacuum tube uh, and about 30 times better than just, you know, 1965 level technology. And this improved even further in the next 20 years. We started putting more and more transistors together into what we call very large scale integrated circuits, right? And so this is about 2.4 million times uh, the cost, the performance per unit cost of a vacuum tube. And then to the you know outrageous 2013 number of about being 250 billion times better than a vacuum tube. So even though it's kind of a silly comparison of comparing everything to vacuum tubes, you know, hardly any other industry can say you know over the course of about 60 years or so it improved 250 billion x right and so that's a really great thing and shows you know a lot about how fast paced the computer architecture and vlsi design and device technology industry has moved so let's talk a little bit more about this so when we're talking about a transistor we're basically just talking about an on off switch that's controlled by electricity so an IC or integrated circuit is when we just combine, you know, dozens, dozens to hundreds of these on a single chip. Then we move on to a very large, set, uh, large scale integrated circuits. So this is when we start, you know, we start getting to the scale of thousands or millions of transistors on a chip, all the way up to this idea of, you know, ultra large scale integrated circuits, where we're doing, you know, thousands or, or, or we're doing past millions all the way to billions. So if you look at something like modern GPUs, like a V100, that will have about 24 billion uh, transistors on it. All right. So not only do we get processors that are, you know, have way more circuit or way more transistors, um, our DRAM capacity improves as well. So DRAM is essentially uh, just a single transistor uh, for each bit. So if we double the amount of transistors we can have in the same area, we've effectively doubled our DRAM, uh, our density of, of our DRAM, right? So this just kind of shows our growth in capacity per DRAM chip over time. And so while this looks like a linear plot, you've got to keep in mind that this Y axis right here is actually logarithmic, right? So this is actually an exponential growth. So about, you know, for quite a while, we were at about 60% increase per year for 20 years. Uh, recently, it slowed down a little bit as, you know, process technology is, an, is improving quite as fast. Right, so now we're down to about, in recent years, more like doubling every two to three years, right? Which is still good, right? So we're still getting more capacity in the same area. Uh, so moving back a little bit, how do we actually get from silicon to, uh, to our chips that we put in our computers? So it all begins with silicon, of course, which is you know, found in sand. So uh, because it doesn't conduct electricity well, it's called a semiconductor, but through a special chemical process that we call doping, we add materials to silicon that allow tiny areas to transform into one of three devices, right? So uh, the three devices are going to be uh, conductors. So this is uh, using either microscopic copper or aluminum wire. We can turn into insulators from electricity, uh, we can, or we can turn them into areas that can conduct or insulate under specific conditions. So basically a switch, right? So they're controlled areas. So transistors fall into the last category Right, so we're really caring about this, you know, things that can conduct or insulate depending on a certain condition, right? Because we care about things that can, you know, we're, we care about switches, right? So we make things out of switches. All right, so how does this how does this process actually happen, right? So 
again, it all starts with silicon. So we start with this giant silicon ingot, right? And then we'll we'll go ahead and slice it up into these thin uh, these thin discs called wafers. Then that actual process of turning you know the silicon into transistors, uh, etc., comes into this you know 20 or 40 processing steps. So that's when we're actually doing our doping, right? So then after that process, we basically have our chips, but they're still you know, they're all on that big silicon wafer. So then we have uh, a wafer tester. So we want to go ahead and test which part of the wafers, you know, you know, where we might have had some flaws inside of our inside of our manufacturing steps. All right. So we'll go ahead and test this. We'll split it up with a dicer, and then we'll go ahead and have these tested dies. And so we'll go ahead and throw out, you know, some of these dies that you know had problems. But you know, even still, we're not at the point that these are usable yet, right? So to make them usable, uh, somebody would buy. They've got, of course, be bonded. We have to bond a die to a package. Right, so then we shove them in a package, then we have our package dies. Uh, but again, this is another step that we have to verify. So we have to you know, put this through a tester and then we'll have our tested package dies, right? So our dies, they get bonded to a package. Then we make sure that everything's okay here. We knock out a couple of the, where there was problems and we ship it to customers. Now, a big key point, uh, key point here is that manufacturing is not perfect, especially once you start getting to smaller and smaller technology nodes like we are now. So it's very likely that you know problems happen when we're manufacturing at you know the nanometer uh, level, right? Or when all of a sudden we are, our transistor size is seven nanometers. You know th this is a really big deal of making sure that you know our processing technology is at a point where we're getting a pretty good yield out of out of these uh, out of these blank wafers, and we're not having you know half of our dye. That's a little extreme, but say half of our dyes being bad. Okay, so moving on a little bit. So yeah, we really care about these defects. And again, it's impossible to really have perfect manufacturing. Uh, there, there might be you know, defects that are incurred by the slicer, something that happens during processing, something that happens during uh, when we're bonding the die to a package. So we have to make, we have to test at a lot of points in this. And so, you know, you know, basically that wafer that we get out of, you know, those 20 to 40 processing steps, it looks something like this afterwards, right? So we've got this, you know, cylindrical, um, wafer, right? And so this is actually um, this wafer that's you know stamped out with a bunch of i7 processors. So this is this is basically your i7 processor before it gets cut up and bonded to a package. All right. So you know, when we're talking about you know how many chips are we getting out of each of these wafers, uh, we're quantifying this as a uh, as the yield, right? So what what is our yield? So it's a percentage of good dies out of the total number of dies on a wafer. And so this is one of the cases where bigger is better, All right? So uh, the way that we you know, measure this, right? So we have, we've got a number of metrics that we use to, you know, to kind of quantify uh, the impact of yield, right? So one of them is cost per die. So we want to keep cost per die low. So um, what happens here in this equation, right? So it's cost per wafer over dies per wafer times yield. So ideally, if your yield's one, it's an equal cost per wafer. If your yield is less than one, um, so it's between zero and one, what ends up happening is that, you know, each of those individual uh, parts that were bad, right? So the cost of manufacturing those just gets distributed into your remaining die that did come out correct. Then our dies per wafer is, uh, is roughly equivalent to the wafer area divided by the die area, but you have to keep in mind something. This wafer is a circle, right? So it's a cylinder, right? So that little, that little chip you get uh, inside of your uh, that you shove into your computer, you'll notice that it's a square or rectangle, right? So you can't actually you, you can't actually have um, you know it's not a perfect mapping of you know die area and wafer area, right? So um, at the edges, right? There are these you know it's it, you know it's a circular thing, right? So you can't completely use up uh, the entire area effectively. So it's but it's a roughly equivalent, right? So then you have your yield, right? And so this is this is something as it says down here. It's based on empirical observations of yields at integrated circuit factories. So it has stuff like defects per area in it. Um, but one thing that you should know, though, right? So you know, uh, with the exponent related to the number of critical processing steps, right? So hence, depending on the defect rate and the size of the die and wafer, costs are generally not linear in die area. Uh, so one of the things to keep in note here is that if you have a lot of defects. Um, it'll really cause your cost per die to go up, you know, quite uh, by quite an extreme amount, right? So you've got an exponent here. 
All right. So this is going to be the basics of you know how your chip actually gets. Um, this is this is the basics of how your your chip gets from silicon all the way to inside of your processor and you know soldered down, right? So uh, you know it's important to understand you know you know how do we get to this you know how do we get to this stage, um, especially when we start thinking about uh, you know a more modern problem, which is the fact that we don't get as free a performance that we did when we could just make transistors half the size. So now we have to be a lot more clever as architects because you know since you know Moore's law is you know kind of slowing down uh, and you know Dennard scaling is all but gone so we can't you know scale our frequency um, anymore we've got to be very clever with the transistor uh, with the our budget of transistors that we have right now uh, and using them effectively but that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode as always feel free to check out my github page at github.com slash coffee before arch where I host all my code for all my other series including CUDA programming so this is GPU programming uh, parallel programming in C++, C++ Crash Course, and Python 3 stuff, as well as a number of other kind of series that I have. But that's going to do it for today. As always, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and I hope you have a nice day.